Well, it's February, the month of love, and it's almost Valentine's Day, so you know we've gotta do something romantic. So today we're hunting down filming locations for Secret Admirer. This one could be considered an early rom-com, and it's got a great cast. C. Thomas Howell, Lori Laughlin, Kelly Preston, a very young Corey Haim with a blonde rat tail, D. Wallace, Courtney Gaines, it goes on and on. It's a classic, and we're hunting down the filming locations. So, let's go see what we can find. So the movie begins in the halls of Burbank High School in Burbank, California. Unfortunately though, a lot of the buildings at Burbank High School were either demolished or heavily remodeled sometime in the 2000s. We then see Michael go running outside and he's running across the front of the school. Now that was right here. You can see it looks a lot different than it did in the movie, but the way that we know that it was here is by this building right here on the corner. You see that brick on the front and then all of those windows on the side? That still matches up with what we see in the movie. Then as he jumps over all the bikes that are parked at the bike rack, he passes in front of a building which is no longer there. That building used to be right here, but unfortunately it also was demolished in the early 2000s. Here's a picture that I found of it as it was being demolished, and you can see that it still matched up with the building that we see in 1985. He then runs around to the back side of the school next to the track, and all of this has changed too. He runs up to a building to try and catch Deb and Tony as they're coming out of class. That building is also gone, but it would have been somewhere over here in this area. As he's walking with Deb and Tony and asking what their plans are for the night, on a building in the background, you can see the word pride with the school mascot. Now it's not the same one, but if you look right over there past the field, you see the word pride and then the school mascot. So they're now walking just outside of the gate when Steve pulls up right about here and offers Michael a ride. Hey, beautiful, want a ride? No thanks, Steve, I'll just walk. Deb gets in the car with Steve and they drive off that way and you can see some of these houses across the street which still look the same. Michael and Tony then head this way down the sidewalk and again, you can see some of these houses behind them, all of them still match up. And then as they get to right about here, this is where the van full of Michael's friends pulls up and parks right here next to this fire hydrant. The fire hydrant's still here and that house across the street still looks exactly the same. So Michael gets in the van and then he and his friends head over to his house, which is this one right here behind me. And the good news is the house is still here and it still looks pretty similar to how it did in the movie. However, it's got a lot more trees and bushes in the front. It's a little bit harder to see now, but right here is where the van would have pulled up and then everybody gets out and goes into Michael's house and raids the refrigerator. And then once they get everything that they need, they head back outside, head up the driveway to this garage and then up to the second story, and that's when they find the letter that Michael was hiding. I just noticed that these two trees in front of the house can be seen in the movie. They're just a lot smaller at the time. So we see the van coming down the street. It then pulls over and parks right across the street from this house. You might recognize this house because it's been used in a few different movies. It's currently getting a bit of a makeover, and up until now, it's looked pretty similar to how it does in the movie. So hopefully they're not gonna change too much on the front of the house. But so they're sitting in the van right across the street from the house, and they're using binoculars to spy on the party that's going on. And we see them looking at the front door and then kind of going from left to right before finally finding Deb standing on the balcony. Now, unfortunately, there's some big hedges now in front of the house, so we can no longer kind of scan around the front of the house like they do in the movie. So they go inside and crash the party. Of course, they end up pissing off Steve, and then Steve and his friends chase them out of the house. We see them coming out of the front door and then running through the yard. The van is still parked across the street. It then takes off and makes a left on Sierra Bonita Avenue. But so they're now driving down this street and you can see that it no longer has that, uh, I'm not really sure what to call it, like cobblestone road. You can see it's not like that anymore. 
But if we come right over here to the gutter, it's the same. They only repaved it up to this point. Also, some of the other streets around here are still like this as well. But so they're driving down this street and then they come to a dead end. There's a gate in front of them for a park. You can see a sign on it that shows the park hours. Now those gates are supposedly down here at the end of this street, but in real life, they're right over here. They're actually right next door to the Kappa Omega house. So they did a little bit of camera trickery. They filmed the van going down this street, but then they brought it back over here for the dead end at the gates. Now, although very similar, these are not the same gates that you see in the movie. If you look at them side by side, there's some slight differences. I mean, of course, they're not the same gates that you see in the movie. They crashed the van through them. Obviously, they had to replace them. But again, they're very similar. I mean, standing here right now looking at them, I can picture the van crashed into them. So after causing all that trouble at the party, Michael pays a late night visit to his best friend, Tony. And right here behind me, this is Tony's house. So Michael comes running around the side of the house and then right there, that's Tony's window. The next morning, we're back at Michael's house. And while Michael's sound asleep, his little brother, who's played by Corey Haim, is stealing all of his money. And while stealing his money, he finds the letter on his dresser and takes that too. He's now reading the letter while eating his Fruit Loops covered in chocolate sauce but when he hears somebody coming, he stashes the letter in his dad's night school book. After he leaves for school, his mom finds the letter and she now thinks her husband's having an affair. Michael walks in as his mom's standing there crying. Not wanting Michael to know why she's crying, she tells him that she's upset because the mailman's late again. Oh, hi, Michael. How you doing? My mother's in there crying and I hope you're happy. Later that night, while at night school, Michael's dad finds the letter in his book and he now thinks that his teacher, who's Deb's mom, is the one that put the letter there. Oh no! Tony decides to help Michael and she writes a letter for him that he can give to Deb. Of course, Tony's writing that letter about Michael, but the letter works and Michael and Deb start dating. I'd really love to tell you that I found the location that was used for Dantenberger, but that would be a lie. I really wanted to find this location, and I really did try, but unfortunately, there just wasn't enough clues. But meanwhile, Deb's mom and Michael's dad are considering having an affair. Oh, and so are Michael's mom and Deb's dad. Oh my gosh, this letter caused so much trouble. 107 North Citrus Avenue in Los Angeles was the home of the Fimple family. That's this house right here behind me. And we first see this house when Deb's mom comes whipping into the driveway. And we don't see a lot of the house at first. We see the driveway and a little bit of the house next door. And then Deb's mom gets out of the car and walks up to the front door. And we get a good shot of the front door from inside of the house. And believe it or not, it appears to be the very same door that you see in the movie with the stained glass window. I can't believe it's the same door after all these years. So Michael's dad is on his way home after being a bad boy and Lou Fimple is going in the opposite direction and they end up passing each other right here in this intersection at Gaffey and 13th Street in San Pedro. Now that gas station on the right side, that's no longer there. It's now a shopping center with a subway, but a lot of the other stuff in this intersection is still the same. Although it's a really quick scene, if you pay close attention and match a lot of the stuff up, you'll see that a lot of it is still the same. So like I said, Michael and Deborah are now dating. So there's multiple scenes filmed outside of Deborah's house with Michael either picking up or dropping off Deborah from a date. So when Michael and Deb's date first begins, we see them pass by a place called Tony's TV Service and Soccer Supplies, which I always thought was kind of funny. But believe it or not, Tony's was a real place. It used to be located right here in this building. Unfortunately, Tony's is gone. So if this weekend you were planning on getting your TV retubed and a new pair of soccer shoes, you're going to have to go to two different places instead of getting that all-in-one service that you would have got at Tony's. But anyways, they're coming down the street, they pass by Tony's, and then they continue down Gaffey and pass by all of these businesses. 
which have also since changed, but funny enough, there's now a soccer store a couple of doors down. So we're now back at Tony's house, where Deborah has convinced Tony to let her throw a birthday party for Michael. Unfortunately, things don't go very well between Michael and Deborah at that party, and when he drops her off, that's the beginning of the end of their relationship. The good news is, Deborah's parents make up, and so do Michael's, as he witnesses the next morning while he's mowing the lawn. Suddenly, Deborah shows up and stops Michael from mowing the lawn to question him about the letters that he wrote her. And they were standing right here in the front yard. Now, when Michael looks at the letters, he tells Deborah that these are not the letters that he wrote her, and of course, that's because Tony switched the letters. Michael then realizes that Tony's in love with him, and he goes inside to call her, but the bad news is, Tony's mom tells him that Tony's about to get on a boat for the next year. Michael takes off running, jumps over his garage and through the driveway of the house behind him to run to Tony's house and try and stop her. Now it appears that the house behind Michael's has since been torn down and they're currently building a new house in its place. Meanwhile, back at Tony's house, her and her parents are already in the car and backing out of the driveway. Suddenly, Michael comes running around the corner yelling for Tony to stop. Now this is supposed to be right in front of Tony's house. This is actually a couple of blocks down, but on the same street. Woo, that was a big front yard. Unfortunately for Michael, it's too late and the car is already driving off down the street. And now we're back on the side of Tony's house. Michael then comes running around the corner at Kenneth Road and Olive Avenue, almost a mile away from Tony's house and the opposite direction of where they were just headed. So as he stands here trying to figure out what to do, he suddenly sees Steve driving down the street and he yells for him and Steve makes a U-turn right here in the intersection and stops his car right here. So Steve parks his car right here and gets out and him and Michael are standing right here in front of this tree. Now obviously the tree is a lot bigger, but it's still the same. Look at this fork right here in the tree. So they're standing right here and Steve is up in Michael's face and Michael ends up punching Steve right in the nose. He then jumps in Steve's car, thanks him for letting him borrow it and takes off down the street that way. Notice the speed limit is still 35 miles an hour. Michael's now speeding down the freeway trying to get to Tony before she gets on the boat and we see him getting on the 110 South from the 405 South. We see Tony and her parents pulling into this driveway and you can see some of the buildings in downtown Long Beach off in the distance, along with these train tracks. The station wagon then continues into the driveway and goes right down this way to the port of Long Beach. We then see Michael getting onto the Vincent Thomas Bridge. And unfortunately, if you try and match up the same shot from the movie, most of the bridge is now blocked by trees. Michael then heads this way down the side of the building. Unfortunately, that phone booth is no longer there, but the tracks on the ground still are. And we see his car heading down this road, but the camera's shooting from the other way. Unfortunately, we can't get in there to get the proper shot. You can see no trespassing, security notice. So this is about as good as we can get. So Michael then climbs up onto some stacks of wood, but on the other side of this building, you can see this is door A and B, and he's in front of door C and D. But Michael stands there on those stacks of wood, and he yells to Tony, who's on the boat, and tells her that he loves her, and then dives into the water. Tony thinks for a second, throws her purse, and then she dives into the water, and Michael and Tony meet right here in the dirty waters of the port of Long Beach, and they kiss, and fall in love and live happily ever after. All right, that is gonna do it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.